Good day, one and all. Welcome to today's podcast, You, Me and Sub 3. This is no ordinary running podcast. This is a running guru podcast. Yes, <laughs> as I try and get those words out. And today's special guest is an ultra marathon runner extraordinaire and also a fellow Bourneville Harrier or a Tealy, just like me. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Lisa Thompson. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? You look very smiley there. For those of you who are listening on a podcast, you can't see how big a smile Lisa has right now, but she has a great big smile. And those of you watching on YouTube, yes, you can see. How are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I've um, just had a, a weekend of running a marathon in the rain yesterday and then a virtual half marathon today. So I'm pretty tired, but pretty pleased with myself, even though the pace was extremely snow, slow. Snow and slow, but hey, it's been storm Dennis this weekend. Snow at one point, but uh, that's quite incredible considering storm Dennis was here at the weekend. And um, obviously, it hit different parts of the country. I'm in uh, London right now. You're in Birmingham. Yes. Yeah. So it's been hitting it in different times and days. So you've done a half marathon. So what's a virtual one? Did Did you actually really go out? I really did. Yes. So yeah. I sign up um, and you have to show proof of how many miles you do uh-huh. uh, I couldn't get there by to the race itself by public transport so I thought this was a way of joining in but doing my own route and my sister who's another tea lady did some miles with me yes excellent excellent so a marathon and a half marathon so if my sums are cra- that's 30 miles in a weekend near enough uh, it's a bit more, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. 13, 39. 26.2 and 13 point. Oh, yeah, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot. So, uh, yeah, it is. A, it's nearly 40 miles. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> so is that like a typical weekend for you? Um, I've lost my money running mojo recently. So I'm trying to get back to what would be a typical weekend. And when I'm up to sort of training for ultras, A typical weekend might be a double marathon or 100k all the way through or broken down into two days. And I do find, because I've been running for a long time, that the way to get the miles in now is, for me, is to enter events because I can't do that procrastination. And, oh, it's nice and warm in here and it's raining out there. So I don't think about it as much if I've entered it. And I get a different sense of enjoyment from it as well. Yeah, yeah. I just suddenly realised I went straight in saying what a typical weekend. It was step step back a few steps. That was my mistake there, where in terms yeah. of if we give a bit of a background as in terms of how you got into ultra marathon running yeah. and uh, how you started as a runner, because the, the mileage that you're doing right now, just as a bit of a caveat to people, because I do see a lot of people on social media. We might touch on this where people see the wonderful fun that people like yourselves are having on these ultra marathons and we'll go through some of your epic races that you've done extremely long distances um like forever (laughs) type distances and uh but you didn't just start that straight away you know um you know you want to give people a bit of a background when you started running you know how, how many years have you been running and how you got into ultra running well next month i'll be 51 and i've been running since i was at school I used to run wow. past school and I was very terrible at it. And I'm not just underselling myself. I really was usually the last one in. Everybody else would be having squash and their biscuits and I, I'd still be plodding around the field. Um, I don't know whether that, that sort of interested me running there. I yeah, yeah. Never thought, but me and my dad set this little goal together that we'd run the Doncaster St. Ledger half marathon and we'd run it together. And in those days, there were no sort of fancy life. I was running in a piece. Yeah, uh, yeah. What year was that? Um, so that would have been 1988. Right, OK. Um, so that was my first half marathon. And uh, me and my dad successfully achieved it. And then we ran a few others, quite a few others together. And I just kept doing half marathons and 10Ks um, until... I think it was 2010. I've got yeah. some down here. Yeah, I, I was going to say, check the notes. So that was 1988. So here, here again, hopefully I'll get this calculation right. <laughs> 32 years ago. 
Wow, so you've been running 32 years, Lisa. So this, that gives a great perspective to a lot of people in terms of your background. So you've got a lot of miles in your legs. Is that, is that the right phrase? Uh, I think that's the right phrase, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. These legs have a certain kind of muscle memory, yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it's easy still. But no. uh, I've been running for a long time, for decades, really. Decade, and you just keep going and going and going. So you've been running all that time. Of, in terms of your longest race, I, I know what it is. Do you want to tell everybody what, what your longest run that you've done, your longest um, ultra? So the longest ultra all in one go was across um, Britain. So it was from Southport to Hornsea. And um, I gained a, a really big buckle for this. Wow. Which is huge and there's a lot of metal in it and it's a beautiful piece. And that was with GB Ultras. So I'd, I'd gradually build, been building up from my first marathon was 2010. And yeah. then my first Ultra was 2012. So I was gradually building up and this was in, um, I think this was 20... 2017 yes it took me 87 hours 36 minutes and 16 seconds and it's 200 miles isn't it yeah 200 yeah. miles yeah. wow yeah. that is incredible so did you sleep no not really no i you this is, has to be part of your strategy about when you're going to get sleep so i did get some sleep but it, it wasn't a lot and i did have hallucinations so mm -hmm. what happened to my brain was I'd be running up to what was a bush, but I'd see it as a party and a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> One stage I thought, oh, there's a barbecue for me. That's amazing. <laughs> and I arrived that it was trees and bushes and the disappointment. Yeah, that was. <laughs> but yeah, the brain does amazing things when you're very sleep deprived. So I did get some sleep, but it it wasn't enough and you do have to push through and miss some sleep to to get to the end really in, in the goal that you want wow i mean that is quite i mean i do hear often of people's stories where they're hallucinating and some of the elite ultra runners you know the ones who are completing it super quick but they're still out for you know a day <laughs> you know 18 hours running at uh, incredible speeds but uh, it must have been when you finished that i mean how did you feel when you finished that? What what kind of words would you describe how you felt when you finished? Um, I was ecstatic. I was very tired. And for people who know me and have run races with me, I'm I'm quite small and petite. I'm only about five foot two, but I can eat like a horse after an hour. <laughs> and I think I did for about four days until wow. I went right enough now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hungry. Um, I remember when I was running across the country that it was from west to east and you um, run underneath the Humber Bridge. And when I saw the Humber Bridge, I knew I'd got myself there on my, under my own legs and power with the help of some friends who ran with me as well. Yeah. And it was a really emotional moment to see uh, the Humber Bridge. So it brought tears to my eyes. I still had about 20 miles to go. It was the longest 20 miles of my life. <laughs> That, that was a, a wow. proud of, um, emotional moment when I saw that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do recall when uh, you're going, uh, having seen some of those pictures of the uh, race and you say the last 20 miles, I mean, that's virtually a marathon at the end. And, you you know, you just keep, do you get your mindset where you just keep going and going? They say it's mind over matter that your body, you know, for me, obviously only doing marathons, only run 26.2. I can't get my head around how you get to do almost 10 times that all at once yeah I, it sounds a lot of the training is mental and emotional as well so mm -hmm. i remember those those the last eight about 18 miles or along um, an old railway line into hornsey and it, it was really boring and i really wanted the end to come and you couldn't see the end and i was in pain and i was walking and i, I remember thinking you know what, you can walk in pain, but it's going to take you longer to get there. Let's just start running. And I, I don't usually listen to music, but I did put on a couple of um, tracks then to help boost my energy. And I got cracking again. And it is really interesting about how much energy you can find, even at the end of a long race like yeah. that, when you just want it done. And there's something there within the body if, if your brain's in the right place to, to find it. Wow. So you're almost training yourself to switch on 
energy type thing so it's not just about what you eat and drink it's uh, tapping into those sources so is there any go on um, yeah you can actually put music on to change your energy if you change from walking to running you can change your energy if you change the sort of messages you give yourself that can give a different boost um, also there's, there's things you can do which I've started doing more recently which look a little strange on races but it's things like yes <laughs> you give this little bit Mo motivating <laughs> yourself yeah. <laughs> yeah and if you're tired and you do a few yeses it, it's a, a surprising how much you can trick the brain yeah. into oh we're awake we're on it again here we go i'll make a note of that so a few fist pumps <laughs> as we go along you know and go, <laughs> yeah. yes i mean that would explain why uh, i've seen in some races having done a few um marathons that depending on where there's crowds people get better times when there's people cheering you on and you yeah. mentioned you had people with you so what you're you're effectively doing to yourself is you're cheering yourself on yes and it's really interesting that the hallucinations on that race were all about seeing people cheering yeah, me on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was, that was amazing that my brain did that. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, what, what possessed you to suddenly decide to do that race, two, 200 miles? So you'd started in uh, 88 doing your first half marathon. Yeah. You'd been running like 20 odd years, done your marathon and then decided to step up to 200. Yeah. The, the big question some people may be asking is, is why, why, why did you decide? Was it, it was something a, in a pub, last minute thing, or did you no. actually give a lot of thought and process and think this is a challenge I really want to do? It was a gradual thing. So a step up from half marathon to marathon in 2010. So I did the London marathon. That gave me a sense of, oh, I, I can run longer. Because I'd get to the end of half marathon and I think, oh, I can't imagine going twice the distance again. Yeah, but yeah. It's all about training and your mindset. So I'd, I had had some challenges in the London marathon, had a few knee problems then. But I changed my strategy and finished it. Didn't aim for a time and just finished it and enjoyed and then I started to read, I don't know whether you know Dean Carnese, but I started to read mm. his books. So uh, the book I read was Ultra Marathon Man. And in that, he gives the message that we're all much more capable than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. And that just sort of started a little seed. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could go longer than a marathon. And at that time, there was the JW Ultra running memory of a runner from Bourneville. Yeah. And so I decided to enter that. That was 30 miles. And so my first ultra was in 2012 um, and really enjoyed that and got a, a good time for me um, and thought, oh, maybe I could go a bit longer. And that's kind of how it kept going. Right. So you just slowly progressed up to it and think, oh, I can do another one and then another and another. But yeah. I'll I know that you've done you've done quite a few, and you you do have a favourite race, which I think we were saying earlier that you you do miss. What was your favourite ultra that you've you've done? Do you have any favourites, or are they all different? Do you have like a a top five, top ten? Um, they're all so different, and they do give you different things. I think the one that I've got the most fond memories of at the moment is uh, Grand to Grand. So that's a, a stage race, so it's self-supported. And what that means is that you have to have everything that you need for that week, it's seven days of running, um, in your rucksack, and you have to carry that. So that means your food, which is uh, freeze-dry, hydrate, uh, food that you have to hydrate by adding water. You have to add your uh, run with your cold water, but they top you up at checkpoints. Your clothes, which I pared those down quite a bit. I was quite <laughs> filthy at the end and called Mucky Puppy uh, because I was so mucky. In fact, I finished one stage and somebody asked me if I'd been crawling up a chimney. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that was my favourite race because it's in America. It starts at the Grand Canyon and ends at the Bryce Canyon. And it's just so beautiful and it makes you realise how little you are compared to that huge nature and huge world. And for me, that's really grounding and was emotional at times. It was a tough race. So a lot of it was on sand um, and we climbed lots of sand dunes on the double day, which was um, just about a double marathon. 
but yeah it was brilliant and I met some great people there and still in touch with them now and, and just miss it. It, it it does sound brilliant so you're getting a bit of FOMO of wanting to go back there and uh, do it again I, I presume it is an annual race yeah it is yeah I don't know if I'd go back and do it again um I'm not sure I might do but I think maybe I'd like to have another go on sand in a desert race mm-hmm. um, got a race where, that I did in Iceland so I've got a contrast because that was extremely cold and whilst I, I got through that fine there, and there, there were different challenges I, I do think there's something um, more pleasant perhaps for me about running in heat but it, it certainly wasn't without its challenges I hadn't taken salt tablets before and on the first day I didn't really have a strategy for taking those and my calves literally cramped up seized up I was crying in agony and I thought, I can't go on for seven days like this. So they're some of the kind of problems that you can come up with and you need to find strategies or chat to your teammates. So all my tent mates there, because we sleep um, at the end of each stage, then they had strategies. And so, yeah, then the next day it was salt tablets every hour on the hour and that saved them any more cramps. It's interesting you were saying that when you're running across the Grand Canyon, you suddenly realise how small we are as people. Yeah. And so do you find it, it's almost like a, philo- would it be philosophical or um, awakening type thing without sounding too, um, as I say, <laughs> philosophical or religious or whatever? Or is, is it sort of like you, you, you discover, you know, hear people the way they discover more about themselves and all that is... Is it that type of thing? Is it like quite empowering to you? Yeah, oh, it is. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a stressful job, so I'm a chief exec of the rape crisis charity. So um, my running has always been to sort of help me deal with stress and release stress. Um, and in ultras, there's something really grounding and yes, sometimes yeah. spiritual. And I, I generally take people that I've lost sort of in my head that I remember and think, oh, I'm if only they could see this and yeah. think them looking down. But also, yeah, there's something really simple about running with everything you own for that week on your back in one bag. And whenever I come back to uh, Birmingham and my life, I always think, oh, there's too much stuff. <laughs> too much stuff around me and too much stuff going on. So there's something really nice about running that there's a simplicity that we we can all join in and all, all different levels that you don't have to do silly miles but we could all get that simplicity in our lives and um, sometimes it's easier to do than others but yeah this is what racers do for me I, that is uh, totally brilliant lisa because I've, I've had the same sort of things myself you get back um being away and you think this is all i need you know we can become i guess we've become a bit more minimalism we don't yeah. need as much as i say there's a lot of stuff out there which uh, which we don't need but um in terms of the uh, those races the grand to grand and and others what would you say is your typical or there isn't a typical race training week or do you just keep running and running and then sort of finally tune before you come to an ultra i mean do you do multiple ultras through the year uh, or... yeah I, um last year i'm just having a look at it one two three four five um six seven i did nine ultras last year wow and a lot of those were for training for running across scotland so that was my a goal and a race last year and sadly i didn't achieve that i got to about 113 miles um so i was just over halfway it's a 215 mile race um, but a lot of those ultras whilst they were great in themselves they were for training Right, right. So when I ran my first um, 100 miles, which I need to remind myself of when that was. So that was in 2014. It was Endura yeah. and, um, and it was um, 91 laps of a 1.1 mile course. So that wow. had it- I'd get a bit dizzy on that one. Yeah. Um, I did have a coach for that. And so they created um, a program. I used to hate him for some of the things he set me like... Um, 16 miles I had to run on Boxing Day and I think I swore every, every mile <laughs> but I did it and that, it was really useful and did get me through those 100 miles but now I create my own training and I tend to do three weeks reasonably heavy training but a lot of it is loaded towards the weekend mm-hmm. um, and then I drop down for a week 
if and the challenge for me at the moment with managing my job and a busy life is getting the miles in the week so if there are any races in the week then I'll try to enter those as well or make running part of my routine to to commute to work when yeah. I get into that groove which I haven't done yet then um, yeah that does help build up miles Right, right. And do you keep uh, track of, you know, do you aim for a certain amount of miles a week? Do you use Garmin tech um, times, yeah. all that type of stuff? Or do you just go on feel and think, oh, I feel like going out for however long I feel and then come yeah. back? So um, I can, I like to run races. Um, if I haven't got a time in mind, and I'm, I haven't got a, a set number of minute miling, which I tend not to do with ultras because it's yeah. end up on the terrain and the weather. So, yeah, I, I can run those without a watch and quite enjoy that freedom. Um, and it, when I was training for the 100 miles with the coach, then he one thing I learned was it, it isn't always just about the miles. We swapped it. So he would talk about time on your feet. Yeah, so yeah. Talk about diet for a six-hour run, or one one run was a twelve-hour run. I think that was the longest I did. Um, and it's just getting used to that. Obviously, you need a clock because you need to know when to start, and finish. But other than yeah. that, you're just running according to feel, and then you're factoring in how you're eating and fueling, how you're hydrating yourself while you're running, and whether you have, want to have a run-walk strategy. And then managing your feet as well, which is very key and really important. Yeah, you, you mentioned a, hunt, a 12 hour training run. Yes. Wow. <laughs> do, you, do you do many of those? Um, well, they tend to be races now. But when I was running, uh, training for the 100 miles with the coach, a lot of my training runs, which were six, eight, 10, 12 hours, were on my own. And I tried to use social media by either telling people I was doing it so I could get a little support from Twitter and Facebook, or I'd tell people so they could join me for a bit of it. And because my 100-mile race that I was training for them was loops, so it's 1.1-mile loops, 91 of them, then mm -hmm. I did uh, specificity training. So the 12 hours was in... <laughs> You're going to be shocked by this. It was in Cannon Hill Park. <laughs> wow. I was looping around Cannon Hill Park. So as far as possible, I was doing a mile, 1.1 mile, to replicate what would happen on race day. I confused quite a few people in the park who were very confused. The gardeners had seen me when they arrived and <laughs> clocked off their shift. I was still going. <laughs> oh, yeah. but it did really help, that, that yeah. going circles training. Well, I guess if you're going round and round there and you've told people that you're there, they can join you for a couple of miles yeah. and, and, and help you around. Uh, but I can imagine the faces of those gardeners. I mean, uh, I mean I've mean, i been out for three hours, but, you know, you're doing 12 hours and you get looks from people when you've just been out and back. But when you're there all day, they think, oh, you know, is it, um, you know, did, did, uh, did any of them stop you to say, you know, what, yeah. what are you doing? They did. They did. One said, do you mind me asking me what on earth are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell him you were from the council and just checking up on them now? <laughs> oh, my brain goes a bit mushy, so I couldn't think of something so witty at the time. Uh, I, 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 about ultras and training, you get to meet some amazing people and you, ha you can have share adventures with them. And I've, I've met some amazing people who I'm still in touch with and and that's been one of the gifts from ultra running and races. Absolutely. I, I can see the uh, the friendships that you've uh, developed there. But towards the end there, you mentioned about get, when you're doing your long training runs and getting your diet and your food and all that kind of stuff. There's a couple of things I wanted to touch on. And that is the your daily type diet, you know, while you're training each day, what kind of foods that you take on board. And yeah. then in terms of the actual race days, how that works. So should, do you want to touch on... You know, what's your daily, weekly food intake like? Um, yeah. Go go, go for it, you know. I'm vegetarian, so mm -hmm. it's a vegetarian diet, although I have been vegan a long time ago in the past, and I'm considering about whether going vegan, because a lot of what I eat is vegan. Um, although I did eat a fair amount of cheese on the 100-mile race. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't, I don't have like a high 
I don't follow a really high carb diet, but I wouldn't say <laughs> it's no carb. So I, I try not to do anything to extremes, but uh, an average breakfast would be um, coconut yogurt, some fruit and some peanut butter. I do eat an awful lot of that yeah. and some protein. Um, and then lunch, occasionally I would have a sandwich, but generally I'd either have hummus and veg, salad. Um, I'd probably have some more peanut butter. <laughs> I did tell you I ate a lot. <laughs> and then it'd be a vegetarian salad or um, hot meal in the evening. Right, um, right. So it, it's it's trying to have as healthy a diet as possible, but I'm not a pasta loading, carb loading person. I, I do have carb. I mean, I have read that a lot of ultras are more fat burners rather than carbohydrate burners. So with and the peanut butter and all that, because peanut tends to have a lot of the good fats in it. Yeah. Is that is that what you're effectively doing is keeping your fat stores supplied? Yeah, I do try to use the different energy system because that has more mm. energy, the fat system. And yeah. I'm not technical, so if you want any technical details, people need to look that up. But there are yeah. some yeah. of Professor Notes has written something, quite a lot about it. But it's trying to get the body used to drawing on that because you can eat less and go longer on that system than mm. use carbs because you use carbs that fuel really quickly. So that means on an ultra race, if you're talking about 100 miles, you're needing to put more and more in your body for a long amount of time. And that could be quite difficult for your body to process or it could for some people increase sickness. Hmm. You can play around with it. I mean, I, I can get nausea and sickness on races anyway. So I, I think I probably do need to introduce a few more carbs on the race and definitely more calories. That was the, one of the main things that put me out of Scotland last year. I was nauseous. I knew I hadn't eaten a lot, but by the time you're nauseous, it's so hard to get calories in. And then I vomited six times, and then you're just chasing calories then. You're using more than what you can put in, and I ran out of fuel, basically. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of that, as I was saying, is, is getting your body used to the uh, the fat burning. So on, on a race day, when you're actually racing, and you, it's interesting you touched on taking on carbs. You know, I see a lot, certainly at marathon distance, half marathon, people just knocking back the gels. Yeah. Um, but I guess you, you can't really do that in a uh, ultra. Uh, you can't be knocking back a gel every half an hour in no. a... Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, people might use gels, but I have had one gel in my entire running career. It sat terribly on my stomach and I vowed never to have it again. Mm. So even when I was training for a, a better time in marathon and halves, then no, I've never not used gels. Um, I do use natural foods. Um, so when I did my first London marathon, I used dextrose tablets, but I've never touched those now. Um, so I use natural foods. I take um, oat bars, um, which are chocolate bars, nut, nut balls. Um, if there's some fruit, that's really good for quenching the mouth, particularly if you've been going for hours. Um, but can be pretty difficult to carry, so you just hope for those at the checkpoint. Yeah, yeah. I always have salt and vinegar crisps with me. Yeah. Um, salted peanuts. And actually, you can feel the, the fat and the nutrients coming yeah, from yeah. For some people, that wouldn't suit them. But for me, then, that those kind of things seem to help. So the big key thing I'm taking from that, then, is during race day itself, <clears throat> is you take on whole foods, real food, mm -hmm. no, no uh, processed package. So, so it sounds proper healthy. So you're having the good food to keep you going for a good amount of time. I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not eating, making sure when I'm running these races, I'm having five fruit and veg a day. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't mind. I want ice cream now. Then I'll, if I'm passing a shop, I'll have ice cream, you know. <laughs> so you really do have to listen. And Dean Carnese in his book talks about how generally it has a really healthy diet. But he talks about having family sized pizzas delivered to when he's doing his training runs, his really long ultras and, and devouring a family sized pizza, which you wouldn't normally have in his ordinary day. But you've got to, if you're craving something, you, you need to listen. 
Oh, Lisa, did you see what I ate last night? Damn, it was, yeah, a whole family <laughs> pizza. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> That's just for you. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Sorry about that, guys, for those who are listening. Um, obviously, for those who are listening and watching, how what me and Lisa eat or whatever, that's personal to us. Please don't try and replicate it. And I think Lisa did iterate whether the sound was coming out really clear. Is find what works for you yeah. and trial and error. Would you say that, Lisa? Yeah. Because you've now been running, as I say, 30 odd years. So, yeah, I think it's really important to say I, I was a runner at one time in my 20s who had eating problems. Um, and I would never advocate, you must eat this. Everybody's got to find what works for them. If that's eating pizzas in a race and the rest of the time, it's got to be what works for them. And I'm just talking about what works for me. I'm not advocating that this is right for everybody. And actually, I've had some problems like sickness on races. So I need to change things a bit. But I do think as runners, we need to be um, looking at food as our fuel and that gives us energy. Yeah. But how that gives us energy for each person is very individual and we, we need to find what's right. Absolutely. I did. When you mentioned that Dean would get pizzas delivered on his races, I did read the lady who's got the world record. I can't remember if it was the 24 hour record or the 100 mile record or both. Um, but her and a coach, I think, basically went to uh, get tacos and coke at 3 a.m. And uh, and that helped to boost the energy for the last sort of I think nine a.m. the race finished, yeah. and uh, so that kept you know so tacos and coke, I I probably wouldn't but uh, you know need mustard water and, and if it works yeah. for them that's that's great, but uh, so if you were to recommend someone Lisa if someone's thinking of getting started in ultras, yeah. how would uh, what steps would you know in in terms of the one two three or the ABC steps for someone who's looking to getting started in ultras mm -hmm. from say if we'll start from a standing start you know from someone who's never run before what would you recommend um, you know sort of your tips for getting started in ultra running i think i've always followed pick a race that your heart goes yes to that there's something really interesting captures your attention about it because the races are good fun generally they might be difficult of course but there's an energy because you're in a race, but it's the training that you need the race to be exciting for, to keep uh, your yeah. interest going in the training. So if you, A, the first thing, the A thing, pick a race that really interests you. Um, so for me, it was a JW Ultra first. I thought I can probably do that off the back of marathon training. This is connected to the club, somebody um, we were running in memory of. It was along the canals. There was all sorts of things that interested me about that race. So I think that's a good tip. Um, can be ambitious, but I would say for, I think it's much better to build up more slowly. But I do know people who haven't followed that and have run really successful races. But I think you are increasing the risk of injury then. Um, yeah because there's a lot of load going through your body and running anyway. And if you're going from doing very few miles to do it, suddenly doing lots of miles, that does increase the chance of injury. Training for ultras finds out all those little weaknesses in your body, the, the lopsided bit, the fact that this knee is stronger than the other knee, and that does show. So actually, if you can build up more slowly and do cross-training, so I do personal training twice a week, I found that, that that really helps because then you can iron out some of those um, differences and weaknesses. So mm -hmm. build up slowly. Um, third one. What's... I think the third one's enjoy it. Absolutely. Enjoy the training. What would you say a lead time for building up? If it was a 30 miler or 50k as a starting ultra, would that be a good re distance to be starting at rather than go straight into 100k or 100 miles? Yeah, I mean, I personally think so. So what I did, I did the mar built up from halves to the marathon and then marathon to 30 miles. Then I did a 12 hour run. And that so that's a race where you can run for an hour, sit down for an hour if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, dictate how much running you do. And then I built. Oops. Sorry, my battery just went. There it is. Um, and yes, yeah, so from the uh, 12 hour, I then built up to um, 100 miles, um, but did it with a coach. Right. I'd say do it slowly. Um, I think I think 50 k's or 50 miles are good. 
but I'd say that it's better for you to have done marathon before you look at those kind of distances. Right, right, right. Okay, so so basically train and finish your first marathon and then once you've got some mileage in your legs then to start yes. looking at training plans and I'm guessing there's all sorts of training plans available online and yeah. that people can select loads, any particular yeah. favorites yeah there's so many we might leave some links but uh, I've got to say Lisa we we could probably talk forever and ever and ever on the uh, ultras <laughs> it's been uh, an absolute pleasure having you on the show if people want to find you where can they find you on the social medias and yeah, so I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I can't remember what my Instagram is. I think it's the same as Twitter, which is um, one LK Thompson. Okay, we'll leave that in the description, yeah. both for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get the exact details if you didn't uh, hear us. We'll leave we'll leave it in the description on the video and the uh, podcast. So all I can say is thank you so much for your time, Lisa. It's been an absolute delight, and and I look forward to maybe talking to you in the future with your next race and how how that goes so thank yeah. you so much for your time and uh, it's an absolute delight and you've done some amazing racing thank you so much you're welcome maybe you could talk when i get across scotland this year oh yes yes <laughs> definitely <laughs> <laughs> definitely thank you so much lisa okay, bye bye, bye.